All right, brothers and sisters, if you would, uh, open your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5, and we're going to look at verses 19 through 27. 2 Kings, again, uh, chapter 5, beginning with verse 19, and we're going to go through 19. Verse 19, yes, through 27. Praise the Lord. From the Word of God. After Naaman had traveled some distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, my master was too easy on Naaman, this Aramean, by not accepting from him what he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi hurried after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running toward him, he got down from the chariot to meet him. Is everything all right, he asked. Everything is all right, Gehazi answered. My master sent me to say, Two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. By all means, take two talents, said Naaman. He urged Gehazi to accept them and then tied up the two talents of silver in two bags with two sets of clothing. He gave them to two of his servants and they carried them ahead of Gehazi. When Gehazi came to the hill, he took the things from the servants and put them away in the house. He sent the men away and they left. When he went in and stood before his master, Elijah asked him, where have you been, Gehazi? Your servant didn't go anywhere, Gehazi answered. But Elijah said to him, was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money or to accept clothes or olive groves and vineyards or flocks and herds or male and female slaves? Is this the time? Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went from Elijah's presence and his skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. May the Lord bless the hearing, the reading of his holy word. Uh, let the people of God say amen, amen. amen. Eternal God, our Father, once again, we're thankful for uh, this opportunity to share in your word. Enable us to focus on what you would have us to know, uh, what you would have us to share, what you would have us to do. So even as Moses uh, ascended on the mountain and humbled himself before you. Likewise, Lord, we humble ourselves before you and we ask that you would speak to us in the name of Jesus. Uh, let the church say amen. Amen, amen. amen. The subject uh, of our sharing this morning is how not to get rich. You're already rich, but how not to get rich. This morning, my brothers and sisters, we are picking up where we left off on last week. And last week, last Sunday, the message was entitled, Don't Jump to Conclusions. And it was based upon this account in 2 Kings chapter 5, where the prophet Elijah healed a man named, Le a man named Laman, Naaman who was the commander of the Syrian army. Uh, Naaman was the second most powerful man in all of Syria, but the Bible said, you know, that he had leprosy. And I didn't talk much about the healing of Naaman's leprosy by Elisha because on last week there were other things that I wanted you to take note of in the text. For example, I wanted you to take note of how God used this unnamed Israelite servant girl who was taken captive by the Syrians, I want you to see how God used her to reach Naaman. I also want you to see the difference between how the king of Israel and Naaman responded to challenges and how the prophet Elijah responded to them. And I hope, I hope that you were able to see 
uh, that genuine faith in God uh, gives you a tremendous, a tremendous advantage in dealing with the challenges of life. Faith in God gives you a tremendous advantage in dealing with the challenges of life. Do you know why? Because faith in God gives you something reliable that you can hold on to. It, it, faith in God gives you something firm upon which you can stand and base your decisions upon. Huh? Faith in God will do that for you. Something reliable, something firm in the midst of the challenges of life. Now, now having said that, I don't want us to forget the miracle that God worked through the prophet Elijah to bring Naaman to salvation. Verse 5 in this chapter tells us that when Naaman the Syrian found out from this servant girl that there was a prophet in Israel who could heal him of his leprosy, he went to the king, he got the king's blessings, and he left Syria. The Bible says he took 10 talents of silver, which is about 750 pounds of silver. He took 6,000 shekels of gold, which is about 150 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. And he took all of these things, this money, uh, this wealth, uh, these material possessions. He took all of these things because in his mind, he was willing to pay the man of God for his healing. The Bible says when he got to Elijah's house, the second most powerful man in all of Israel, when he got to Elijah's house, Elijah himself didn't come out to meet him, but he sent a messenger out to say to him, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed of your leprosy. Well, the Bible says after Naaman threw a fit, after Naaman, after Naaman threw a fit because he thought he was being mistreated, it says he relented, he repented, he went to the Jordan River, did as he was told, and he was healed, he was cured of his condition of leprosy. The Bible says he then went back to Elijah's house and he offered to give him all of the money and all of the clothing that he brought with him in appreciation for what Elijah had done. But the Bible says that Elijah flat out refused him. However, when he said to Elijah that from now on for the rest of his life he would only worship the God of Israel, it says then Elijah gave him his blessing and he said, go in peace. Now at this point we pick up where we left off. All right. Now, Elijah, as we just read, had a servant named Gehazi. And the text says that Gehazi said to himself, he said, my master was too easy on Naaman this Aramean, this Syrian, by not accepting what he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him, and I am going to get something from him. And that's exactly what Gehazi did. He heard after Naaman, and when Naaman saw him coming, he stepped out of his chariot. He got out, and he asked Gehazi if everything was all right. And Gehazi said, yes, everything is all right. But then he said, but my master, Elijah, sent me to tell you that two young men of the prophets have come to him and they need a talent of silver and they need two sets of clothing. And of course, Naaman was more than happy to oblige after all that Elijah had done for him and he gave Gehazi what he asked for. And the Bible says that Gehazi took what Naaman gave him and he put those things away in his own house. Now, I want you to make note of a few things about Gehazi's decline. And I say Gehazi's decline because after this event, Gehazi lost his position as Elijah's right-hand man, and he also lost his health and became a leper. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is Gehazi's attitude toward his master, the prophet Elijah. His attitude suggests that Elijah really didn't know what he was doing, that he had somehow missed an opportunity to become wealthy or to make a profit, that in his naivete, in his lack of wisdom or sound judgment, uh, Elisha had been too easy on Naaman, who after all was an enemy of Israel. In other words, Elijah was saying, why not take something from Naaman because he's already probably taken something from our nation. That was Gehazi's attitude. He became critical in a negative way of the prophet Elijah. Now, he had what I would call the what about me spirit. 
at the wrong time and in the wrong context, but it did reveal what was really in his heart. You see, it revealed that Gehazi wasn't really concerned about ministry as much as he was concerned about enriching himself. Huh? Ministry for Gehazi apparently was just a way to make a profit. Now, this reminds me, my brothers and sisters, of, Judas, of Jesus' disciple, Judas, uh, the one who betrayed him. Uh, in John chapter 12, it tells us that Judas became angry with Mary, who took a pint of expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet, and then she washed his feet with her hair, wiped his feet with her hair. Now, by all accounts, uh, this, what Mary did, was an act of worship. And it showed that Mary anointed Jesus because she understood that she, he would die for the sins of the world. Even after he explained to his disciples that he was going to die, they never fully grasped that. They never understood it. They never fully believed it. But Mary was the one who believed it. So she anointed Jesus for, in a sense, his burial. And after she anointed his feet, the Bible says that the fragrance of the perfume, or should I say the fragrance of of her worship and her adoration for Jesus. It filled the house. But Judas, John said, Judas became angry because for him, it wasn't about honoring Jesus. He said, he said to Mary, he said, this perfume, uh, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? But when John looked back on the event, he said, Judas didn't say this because he cared for the poor. He said this because he was the keeper of the money bag and he used to help himself to what was put in it. He was a thief. And so Judas walked with Jesus because he was all about enriching himself, all about making himself shine, all about getting his bling on, and that's the same attitude that we see in Gehazi in our text. Now, what makes all of this so sad is that Gehazi had seen Elijah raise a boy from the dead. That's right. He had seen Elijah feed 100 people with only 20 loaves of bread. He had seen Elijah miraculously save a widow uh, from going into debt. He had seen Elijah in this final event. He had seen Elijah heal Naaman the Syrian of leprosy. At the very least, he knew that Elijah was a bona fide man of God. Gehazi knew that. But that, but his misplaced, what about me spirit overruled what he knew about Elijah. And so, and so because he was greedy for material things, that's number one, because he was greedy, number two, he lied to Naaman and he claimed that Elijah had sent him. And in lying to Naaman, number three, he misrepresented Elijah, the man of God. And number four, when Elijah asked him about what he had done, Gehazi tried to cover it up. He didn't confess what he had done, but rather he tried to hold on to the material things that he had, and he tried to justify what he'd done. In other words, he tried to justify his actions by lying to the man of God. And so Elijah pronounced that he and his descendants would be lepers, and he dismissed him from his servants. Gehazi and, and Judas, might I add, are examples of how not to get rich. The Bible says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but to lose his own soul? Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, Jesus said, you cannot serve both God and money. Either you will hate the one or you will love the other or you will be devoted to the one and you will despise the other. You cannot serve two masters. Now, now notice Jesus doesn't say that you can't have money. Uh, he just says that you can't serve money. Uh, you, can't, you can't love both God and money because the one you give your heart to is the one that you will worship. And, and, and there's only one, my brothers, who is worthy of your worship and your praise, and that is God himself. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, Jesus said, if you were to seek first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness. He said, you don't have to worry about money and material things because the Lord will provide all of your needs. That's what he said. You know what Paul said in Philippians? Paul said, and my God 
shall supply all of, not some, but my God shall supply what? All of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus, right? So now in our text, if Gehazi's heart had been right, he would have known, he would have known that he was already rich. If his heart had been right, he would have known that he already had everything that he could ever need. Listen, if you are in Christ, then as a person, you're already rich. And your wealth is not strictly tied to money. Jesus said this. Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone. Or, or, or you can say man does not live by money alone or by houses and land and clothing alone, but he lives by what? By every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, the question is, do you believe God's word? Huh? Do you believe that you are who God says you are? Because if you believe that, then that means that all of the riches in God's kingdom are yours. Why? Because you are a son of God, you are a daughter of God, and you are a citizen of the kingdom of God. And so you cannot reduce the riches of God to just money, huh? There is such a richness called peace. There is such a richness called health. There is such a riches called healthy relationship. You cannot reduce what God will give you to just money. Huh? Now, if you want to be a servant of God, if you want to be a minister of God because you want to make money, I'm here to tell you that you are on the wrong track and you are in it for the wrong reason. I don't care what you see on TV, those pastors, those tele events, they are in the minority, right? So now if there is anyone who ever says, I want to enter it, uh, the, the ministry and I want to make a lot of money, you are in it for the wrong reason and I guarantee you, you're on the wrong track. My brothers and sisters, there, 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 there is no substitute. There is no substitute for putting God and the Lord Jesus Christ first in your life. There is no substitute. I don't care what your issue is. I don't care what you're going through right now. Listen to me. There is no substitute for putting God first in your life. You know what Paul said about that? Paul says, let me tell you how my life is. Paul says, the main thing I want to do in my life, he says, I want to know Christ. He says, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. I want to have fellowship. I want to have an understanding of the sufferings that Jesus went through. I want to know his mind. I want to know his heart. I will place nothing above knowing the Lord Jesus. Everything else is rubbish to me. That's what Paul said. That's what Paul said. If as a son or daughter of God, you already know how rich you are. If you know that, then you wouldn't have to lie. You wouldn't have to cheat. You wouldn't have to steal. You wouldn't have to come up with get-rich-quick schemes. You wouldn't have to succumb to greed in your heart. You wouldn't have to boast about what you have or about who you are. If you are a son or daughter of Christ, and if you know who you are, you wouldn't have to do any of those things. Why? Because you would know that your God and my God is the one who is able to supply all of your need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. The doors of the church are open. And uh, we invite you to become a part of us. Uh, we're not a perfect church, but we're striving to be all that God would have us to be. If you don't have a church home, will you come? If you, will you come? If you don't know the Lord Jesus, and I'm here to tell you, you need to know him because if you don't know Jesus, and if you haven't given your life to Jesus, I guarantee you that you are worshiping something or someone else. And you can't serve two masters. Either you're going to love one or hate the other, or you're going to be devoted to one and despise the other. But God is the only one who deserves first place in your life. We invite you to come. We invite you to come and receive the eternal life that God has.